Hey, last week we had a great conversation with Dr. Paul Kengor about this brand new book, The Devil and Belladad, One Woman's Struggle Against Communism and Her Redemption. We really got to the heart of the, did Bella ever actually say, claim that she helped to infiltrate the Catholic Church, the communist? And if so, what did she do? And can it be proven? That was a fantastic conversation, or we're going to link to it uh, in the email again coming out this Friday. So make sure you're on our CDT Insider email at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. Join today. But he joins us once again by Zoom chat to continue that conversation. Good morning to you, Dr. Ken Gore. Hi, Joe. How are you? Praise be to God. I am alive and that counts. How are you? I'm good. Happy uh, pre-Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Eve. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. I want to jump right in, and I want to start with this uh, on page 284. You're, you're quoting Sister Lucia dos Santos in 1958, who wrote to Pope Pius XII. And uh, she said, Your Holiness is aware of the existence of the so-called secret of Fatima enclosed in a sealed envelope that can be opened after the beginning of the year 1960. Although I cannot talk about the text contained therein because the time is approaching, I must say that in the 60s, in the 60s, communism will reach its high point, which can be diminished in intensity and duration and which must be followed by the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the reign of Christ, close quote. You go on to talk about Vatican II and communism uh, after, again, the context of Bella Dodd and the Communist Party trying to infiltrate the Church, and you talk about how there was like 378 bishops before the Council all wanted the Council to deal forthrightly with communism, and yet Vatican II didn't address communism. Tell us what's going on here in context of your book. Yeah, I think this is one of the biggest failures of Vatican II. And 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 really when when you look at it, the full sweep of it, so you so you had Pope John the Twenty Third first, right, who starts Vatican II, and then he died into it and and then came Pope Paul the Sixth. Right from is what 1963 to 1978, and 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 Paul VI, who you know, was a saint, the you know the, the Pope of Humana Vitae, and you know just a great Pope in so many ways. But when it came to communism, he pursued what was known as Ost Politique in Europe or Détente in the United States, and it was this policy of learning to get along with the communists, learning to get along with the Soviet Union. And that was pursued bipartisan in the United States by Republican presidents Richard Nixon, who was considered you know, a hawk in foreign policy, Gerald Ford, his successor, Jimmy Carter, the Democrat. And you know, they all believed that the best way to manage the Cold War was treaties and trade, right? Mm. We've got to find a way to reduce the likelihood of a confrontation of a nuclear exchange. So, so you know, their view was we need to accept that Eastern Europe is behind the Iron Curtain. It's in the Soviet so-called sphere of influence. Let's not rock the boat. Let's not have World War III. Now, that's replaced by this Polish pope, right, John Paul II, who comes in in 1978, Ronald Reagan in the United States, people like Margaret Thatcher, others. And Reagan said, look, detente is immoral because it sells out the people of Eastern Europe. It is not a moral policy to tell the people of Poland, of Hungary, of Czechoslovakia, of East Germany, that everything is okay for them if we make a deal with their slave masters and keep them in this permanent status quo where they have no religious freedom, no freedom of speech, no, no right to vote behind the Iron Curtain. So Reagan said, and he and John Paul II agreed on this, that the best approach was to reverse communism in Eastern Europe, to try to peacefully win the Cold War. So to go back to Vatican II, that was not how Vatican II looked at it. And a lot of the bishops at the time were really bothered by this. They wanted the church to do what it had been doing since Qui Pluribus was published by Pope Pius IX in 1846, two years before the Communist Manifesto was even published. They wanted the church to, to strongly condemn communism. But you know, certain forces intervened at Vatican II, and the best that they could do, Joe, was come up with some footnotes <laughs> yeah. Yeah, footnotes to the documents. So there's these these unpublished um, you know, edicts against communism from Vatican II, and it just utterly failed to condemn 
what the church in 1937 called the satanic scourge of communism. It was a real failure in that regard. Yeah, I, a lot of Catholics are now having great difficulty with Vatican II as a result to this and other issues that came out of the council. And, uh, and as I mentioned in the last segment, we have 60 years of terrible numbers uh, in the church. And uh, you know, people people feel like they're tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists, but at the same time, the numbers don't lie. The church has suffered so much since the council. Uh, and well, and when you look, yeah, and when you look at things like like liberation theology, yeah, um, what's what's happened with the Jesuits? I mean, there are many really good Jesuits, but but I mean, look at um, the flagship publication of American Jesuits is called America Magazine, and in July 2019, they published a piece called "The Catholic Case for Communism." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you would have never <laughs> seen that right. uh, pre-Vatican II under any of the popes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's an astonishing thing to see. You know, speaking of uh, liberation theology, I'm, I have the book in my hand, Liberation Theology, How Marxism Infiltrated the Catholic Church by Mr. Julio Laredo, who uh, I have that. we had him on uh, not too long ago when the book came out, he, we, we had him in the studio. And when I was uh, thinking about this, in, in your book, you talk about how they were primarily infiltrating the Dominicans in 1936. And I thought that was really interesting because I remember reading in this book um, how the Dominicans in South America were huge and pushing for liberation theology. And I was like, oh, wow, that's... That's really fascinating. And this was prior to the Second Vatican Council, which was uh, resulted in Professor Plinio writing his In Defense of Catholic Action, uh, with the basic Christian communities uh, popping up in South America and in the U.S., which are these kind of communist homes, uh, so to speak. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that situation? Yeah, I was really surprised about that as well, because today the, 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 the Dominican order in the United States, I mean, they are just a rock, right? I mean, they're fantastic. Uh, you know, the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. But, but back in those days, they were looking to penetrate these orders and different committees and groups anywhere that they possibly could. There's a group called the Catholic Committee for Human Rights. You know, that came up under literal congressional hearings as a possible communist front group. And some of the people that we quote in The Devil and Bella Dodd that will surprise people, that Dorothy Day's Catholic worker made a beautiful stand against communism on the front page. We quoted at length in the 1930s, uh, 34, 35, they were rejecting what was the, the so-called outstretched hand of Earl Browder, the head of Communist Party USA, who was trying to make common ground um, with the Catholic Church. And, and Dorothy Day's daily worker came forward and said, look, we, we may agree with you on things like helping the poor, better working conditions, re maybe redistributing some wealth, but you folks have a strictly materialistic view of the world. You deny the existence of God. You do not believe in the supernatural, right? Our church has said that communism is an evil, right? No, we cannot agree with communists. So they were really good at making these, these distinctions, by the way, in a way that progressive and liberal Catholics today are not. And, and, and there, there have been progressives and liberals in the past, even people like Woodrow Wilson, right? The progressives progressive who were telling yeah. fellow progressives in the 1910s, um, look, we might agree with the communists again on some of these things, but these people are barbarians. They are terrorists. These people are bad news. You don't go that far to the left. Mm -hmm. So they were able to better draw these nuances and lines of distinction in ways that people today in the church who are not informed on these issues are not able to do. And by the way, I blame a lot of this, not just on schools, but on Catholic colleges that are not faithfully Catholic anymore and have, um, have completely Amen. failed to teach these things. Amen. Hold that thought. Dr. Paul Kengor is our guest again. Bishop Fulton Sheen noted, quote, that the infiltration of seminaries began in 1936. At that time, the average age of man entering the seminary was between 18 or 20 years old, with uh, priestly ordinations around 23 to 27 years old. Thus, people who had entered the seminary in 1936 would have been ordained in 41, 43. That would make them approximately 45 to 60 years old at the time of the council. Uh, that comes to us on page 291. Now, I, I start there again to go, golly gee whiz, uh, the fruit of the communist effort to infiltrate the church, Bella Dodds and her colleagues, I mean, it was ripe for the picking at one of the most 
pivotal times in church history when this council comes together, and as we were talking about in the last segment. But now I want to switch back to Bella Dodd. She gets out. She wants out. She kind of has a, a, an awakening. You have a great chapter on that where she starts to lose faith in the communist way of life, in their, uh, in their uh, philosophy. She realizes it's an abusive system, and she wants out. But that's not easy. It's kind of like the mob. When you're in, you, you kind of mm -hmm. don't get out. Can you speak to that, Dr. Ken Gore? Yeah, well, it's exactly right. And in fact, she's described it as even worse than that. She described it as extricating herself from the devil, right, from from the evil of communism. So so she eventually, Joe, came to agree with her church that, that communism was satanic. And and I mean, that bad, that not just a bad thing, but but right from the pit of hell. And, and she started trying to pull away. She, she had this moment in 1951 where she went to visit her congressman in D.C. because she's an attorney and she's trying to make money. She's trying. She's been so smeared by the party, which called her a racist, an anti-Semite, um, you know, anti-Negro, anti-Puerto Rican. Those were the words they used in their press release. They would have called her a homophobe, I'm sure, or, or uh, anti-trans if those words were, were around back then. But she meets with Congressman McGrath. And, and he said, he said, isn't there something I can do for you, Bella? I can tell that you're hurting. And, and she said, no, I've got the KGB following me and the FBI following me. Hmm. And he said, how about, how about seeing a priest? And she said from like her, from the, her, her inner part, she said, yes, hmm. yes, I want to see a priest. So, so he had, he went to his secretary, Rose, and said, see if you can find Monsignor Sheen from Catholic University. Wow. If you can get him on the phone. So they, they called over and, and he said, yes, send her over to my house in Chevy Chase, Maryland. I'll see her tonight. <laughs> so she walked in and, and she, she said it was amazing. He came out just like he did on the television screen, right? His wow. silver cross <laughs> gleaming, this warm <laughs> smile in his eyes, you know, this, this pectoral uh, cross. And he held out his hand and, and he said, uh, doctor, he called her doctor. He said, I'm glad, I'm glad you've come. And, and she said, Joe, that, you know, had, had he been like the Bolsheviks and, mm -hmm. and the Communist Party USA members in the way that, that they treated her, that they treated her, he might have said, uh, you know, you old Bolshevik bag, what are you doing yeah. in here? Yeah. But instead, he was all mercy, all kindness. He said, I'm glad you came. You look unhappy. And, and she said, well, why would you say that? And he said, well, in some way, we priests are like doctors. And we can diagnose a patient, you know, just just by looking at him. She began to cry. She began to weep. And he put his hand on her shoulder and said, you know, there, there, just let it go. Let it go. And and she just started weeping. And she said it took she don't know how it happened. But a few minutes later, without even realizing it, the next thing she knows, they're both on their knees together before a statue of the Blessed Mother in the chapel. And he, he gave her a rosary. He talked to her more. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be going back to New York to his offices for the Society for the Propagation of the Faith in the winter. And why don't you come and talk to me and take instruction to come back into the Catholic Church of your youth? Mm, and she wow. did. She did. And she was baptized at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York on April 7th, 1952. That's incredible. You know, there's so much to say about Fulton Sheen. He's just all class. And uh, God, golly, <laughs> I just wish, you know, there was there was more priests today that uh, that would emulate his style, you know, his uh, his his real love for souls. And there's a lot to say also about, you know, their relationship. Uh, Fulton Sheen, if I'm not mistaken, he, he goes on to become her spiritual director. So there's uh, there's some nuance there. There's there's obviously some things that are private that will never come out. But I'm wondering, you know, we had a conversation here in the studio after we, we interviewed you uh, last week. You know, why was it that Fulton Sheen prevented her from naming these names, these these communists? Because this is obviously it's affecting the whole church, the entirety of the church. Why not uh, allow her to say the names? Yeah, it's a good question, Rudy. And if you, but if you really think about it, the idea people might say today, well, Sheen didn't want to cause scandal, right? Yeah. And and people might say, well, was it really that scandalous? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. today you might have publications, Jesuit publications, writing articles like the Catholic Case for Communism. But in the 1930s, I, I mean, 1937, 
the year after Bella started this in 1936, the church releases an, an encyclical called Divini Redemptoris describing communism as a satanic scourge mm -hmm. right out of the pit of hell. Uh, the, the Pope Pius XII issues a papal decree on communism telling any Italians that if they vote for the Communist Party, they're excommunicated, telling Catholic publications wow. that if they print anything positive about communism, they're excommunicated. Jesuit uh, America magazine would have been excommunicated 60 years ago for, for that piece. So the idea to find out from a woman who was one of the highest ranking members of the Communist Party and definitely maybe the highest ranking among, among women in the party, that, that the church had been infiltrated with, with uh, the planning of communists as priests and seminaries would have been really scandalous. So he, he said to her, and, 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 she, and she said, Rudy, I'm going to go into the most penitential order on the planet, Bishop Sheen, wow. to make reparation for the rest of my life for Amen. what I've done. And he said, no, here's what I want you to do. And it was what Pius XI told him. I want you to spend the rest of your life warning people about the dangers of communism. That's how you can make reparation. And yet, three weeks after that, after he brought her into the church, April 7th, 1952, an article appeared on the front page of the New York Times saying Fulton Sheen in church, St. Susanna Church in Rome, warns of a red infiltration in the priesthood. Mm. So Sheen himself kind of couldn't help, <laughs> but at least on one occasion, when he got there in Rome, maybe not knowing reporters were there, said that. But he never said it again, as you, far as I can tell. He know, never said it again. I, he knew how scandalous that, that this would be. I'm thinking of, when you were saying this, the, the book Goodbye, Good Men that came out in 2002 by Michael Rose and how they, they talks about the, the fact that good men were kicked out of the seminary and bad men were pushed through the seminary. And it blew my mind reading this um, way back when, because I believe this came out in 2002. And this uh, it sounds like, like you said, like so, Fulton Sheen does this. However, in retrospect and looking back, hindsight is twenty twenty. Would it have been better if we had just revealed it all and Fulton Sheen not have it kind of hush hush and kind of fight it from the inside and maybe shine some light on it? Yeah, maybe so, Adrian. Although you look, we we did win the Cold War uh, ultimately, um, but you know, but now it's back again. And I've had I've had people, I've had priests tell me about being in a seminary and having you know an older priest or professor there saying things like, "Well, you know, that kind of sounds like you know strident McCarthyism, right? Anti-communism, right? You know, cr cr criticizing them for being too anti-communist." Mm -hmm. And imagine that. Imagine uh, it, 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 the response should have been, "Wait a second, you know." Sir, you know, Monsignor or whoever, our church described communism as a satanic scourge. Right, yeah. Uh, we ought to be criticizing this. Amen. But the kind of, the, if that spirit of Vatican II is correct, they didn't want any condemnation of communism, or at least the people that were coming out of that milieu that Belladon was part of. So that could be part of a larger, if not infiltration, maybe kind of infestation of the church. Yeah. And again, look at Marxist liberation theology which prompted John Paul II when he got to Nicaragua to, you know, say to that bishop, you know, shook his finger at him, right? You cannot support this stuff. Um, even, even Pope Francis said in 2013, the Marxist ideology is wrong. And then he said, but I have many friends who are Marxists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's part of the whole problem. The church said it's wrong. Confusing. And so being a loyal pope there, he's saying, yeah, it's wrong. But then again, I got a lot of good friends who are Marxists. And you wonder, who are some of those good friends who are Marxists? You know, are some of them priests in Argentina? That's yeah, a problem, man. Exactly. And then, of course, uh, post-World War II, you had the flight of high-ranking Nazis into Argentina and other parts of Latin America. So how much did they fan the flame of socialism and Marxism in right. Latin America that only made it even that much more worse. So you've got the out-and-out -out Soviet communists working uh, through the Comintern, and then you've got uh, so, uh, so, uh, socialists, national socialists and fascists, uh, who are all competing for their version of Marxism. It's, a, it's an internal civil war, but it's the same spectrum. Uh, and, and on the same And that's what slope. Nazism was. Exactly. Right, Joe? I mean, exactly. Nazism, Nazi, it was the German National Socialist Workers Party, right? And, um, but, 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 you know, so Sheen told her this could cause a major scandal. And I got to share this quickly. I think this is a really touching story. Bella Dodd was not in good health 
And she ends up going in for gallbladder surgery, fairly routine at St. Vincent Hospital in New York in 1969. And she went into a coma. Her friends were shocked and she's dying. And they're, they're looking for a priest. Can we get a priest in here? Bishop Sheen just happens to show up to visit her at the hospital. And she's in a coma for days. And she opens her eyes one time and looks up, and he's standing there. Wow. And, and he looks at her, makes the sign of the cross. They could tell in her eyes that she recognized him. He gives her the anointing of the sick and then sends her off into the next world. And so just imagine kind of the heroic role that somebody like a Fulton Sheen played played in the life of Belladot. And man, she made good in that promise to him yeah. in 1952 through 1969 to warn the world and, and the country about communism and communist influence. And really, yeah. she's still warning us today. Wow. Well, we are out of time, and that is exactly how I wanted you to end it. Uh, what a great story that is. All in this book, The Devil and Belladad, over a thousand footnoted references. It's really a great book if you're looking for uh, a confirmation. You know, where are the receipts on Belladad? They're right here. Go to tanbooks.com. The Devil and Belladad, Dr. Paul King Gore. God bless you. God love you. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving to you. Same to you, Joe. Thanks, guys. God bless. David O. Grace coming up next hour. Join us. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT. We'll see you back.